Hello, I'm Alex Mansfield with Manny Things, and welcome to another episode of Manny Talk Shooting, the show where I talk to individuals all across the shooting industry. We'll talk competition, self-defense, concealed carry. If you enjoy this content, check out our YouTube channel, Manny Things. Without further ado, let's get to this episode. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Manny Talk Shooting. Welcome. We're back for another episode. Thanks for checking it out, enjoying the day. I need to tell you guys something. This episode and further episodes are sponsored by Go Fast, Don't Suck. So go go see Bill. Go buy some crap. Go check out his memes on Instagram. So remember, go fast, don't suck dot net. Uh, go get entertained. Buy some crap. So anyway, without further ado, I want to introduce my guest today. Um, this is a guy local to me. If you're in the Michigan area, you've probably seen him at many local matches around the state. This is Mr. Jeff Garrick, the match director of Livingston Gun Club. How are you doing so much? much? Not too bad. Uh, just to correct that, I'm not the full match director of Livingston Gun Club. That goes to you know a handful of other people. Um, you know, I pretty much am the match director for Ryan Rocks and and all the other monthly local matches. That is another that is another team that puts that together. Well, we've been staying corrected. <laughs> match director for Ryan Rocks, guys. Well, we'll we'll find out more about Ryan Rocks just a little bit. We need to first get to know Jeff a little bit better. I know him. He's an awesome stand-up guy. So if you see him at a match, shake his hand, tell him hi. Um, but Jeff, how'd you get into shooting? Uh, th- thank you for the, the compliment. Um, I got into shooting uh, just like a, lot of, like a lot of other kids do. Uh, it was something that my dad did. And, you know, my dad was always a person that, you know, worked hard, worked overtime. He was working anywhere between, you know, five to six days a week for the most part. And Sundays were always the day that he had off. And I would always notice that dad would kind of disappear and kind of do his own thing on Sundays. And the older I got, it was, you know, oh, dad is going to a gun club. He's going to shoot. And there would be times where it would be a family affair where my brother, sister, and I would, you know, drive out with my mom and dad and we'd go out there and, you know, hang out, hear the gunfire and, you know, enjoy the day. And then the older that I got and the stronger that I got, then it started opening up the realm of, you know, my dad would ask me if I was interested and, you know, and I, you know, big, you know, big glowing eyes of like, yeah, I want to, I want to do that. So, and, you know, once I started to pull the trigger, it was, it was something that was addictive to me and, you know, I wanted to continue doing it more and more. And then lo and behold, Sunday started to turn into, you know, uh, you know, dad Sunday. And, you know, we, and I would start shooting the matches and it's just stuck with me since then. Now, um, when you started shooting with your father, did you start like on 22s or do you start like nine millimeter shotguns? Uh, the, the first thing that I remember shooting was a 38, uh, 38 revolver shooting at bowling pins. And then uh, once I started getting into competitions, I was primarily shooting shotgun. And at Livingston, uh, we used to shoot a lot of bowling pin, bowling pin matches. And there used to be a very, very famous, you know, well-known match in Northern Michigan called Second Chance. And that was a, one of the largest bowling pin matches around. And it would be a lot of a lot of practice and a lot of shooting to prepare for second chance. And at the time, you know, as a, you know, when I was when I was smaller, still growing, my dad didn't want me shooting a you know full fledged you know 1911 45 mm-hmm. because he didn't want me to go through you know having any kind of you know long lasting damaging effects to you know my elbows and my forearm and some and things of that nature. But I was able to handle a shot. But I couldn't handle a 1911-45 in his eyes, but I was perfectly fine taking on a, a, a full length, you know, a Remington 1112 gauge. But um, I had a lot of fun and a lot of success with shooting shotgun bowling pins. And, you know, and, it, and then it progressed to handgun, af- handgun and three gun after that. Now, have bowling pin matches just kind of disappeared in our area? Because I've never heard of a bowling pin match. <laughs> You know, I, I question the same thing. Um, I asked my dad that, that very question from time to time, they are still around. Um, you know, they, they shoot bowling pins in Gaylord, you know, in up North every Wednesday night. Uh, that's something that's done there. And then, 
uh, Matt Davis has tried to get the second chance match, you know, back on the map. So that's, that's slowly working its way back in, but you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's a little niche, you know, where, you mm -hmm. know, you, you have to find the little pockets of where it's done. Gotcha. And I forgot your dad is up upstate in lower peninsula, correct? Yes. Yeah. Cause I think I've had a, I had a little bug put uh, something in your ear about coming on the show. My buddy Jason up at uh, Antrim. Yes, he says your uh, your dad's up there. So, because yeah. I was surprised to hear that Jeff Garrick's up at Antrim. I'm like that's a <laughs> long drive from Detroit. <laughs> yep it uh, it had been a while since I since I shot a match with my dad. So you know every uh, I've done it the last two years where uh, the timing you know worked out where I was able to say you know, all right, you know, wife and kids, we're going to go up to grandma and grandpa's for the weekend. And oh, yeah, by the way, I'm going to go and shoot on Saturday with dad over at Mencelona. <laughs> yep. Can't be one of those days. Those are always fun. Yeah. Besides that, you're shooting in a sand pit. <laughs> <laughs> right. <sighs> but I mean, Houghton Lake's like that too. Houghton Lake is nothing but sand too. And it's mm, not my favorite. <laughs> yeah. So Jeff, yeah. are, have you taken any formal instruction like in competition shooting? No, myself. It, it no. It's just been. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of high quality shooters at Livingston Gun Club when when I was a, when I was a kid growing up. Um, probably the most well known name that you would, that people would know if I mention it is Pat Sweeney. Uh, I grew up shooting with Pat Sweeney every, every given Sunday. And, you know, and I, I try to think of myself as a sponge where I try to pick up on things on, on observing myself. Mm -hmm. So I may or may not be getting direct instruction from somebody, but just by, by watching somebody, watching what they do, watching how they move, how they handle things. I try to mimic that myself. Gotcha. Awesome. So that's pretty cool. And you're, uh, you're a GM level uh, limited shooter, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes. That's what I've remembered. Um, I know gear is not super important, but I know we have a lot of people who love talking about gear. So you want to run down what your kind of your competition gear is? Uh, I have a CR speed belt, CR speed back pouches. Um, it's, a, it's a rig that I've had for probably since 1999, 2000, 2001, somewhere in that range. Um, they, they, they've held up. There's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, I've gone through a gambit of various different holsters, um, but so currently right now I am using a GX holster. Oh, Leif makes a phenomenal holster. I finally, finally got mine. Nice. Nice. Oh. Prior to prior to that, I was using uh, Double Alpha Race Masters, and there, you know, they, I was starting to have you know some inconsistency issues with it, and you know, and then uh, when Leif came, to, you know, somewhat closer to Michigan because he moved from the East Coast to Kentucky, mm -hmm. and then once I started to see what his holsters were like, and you know, Leif is a stand-up guy himself, and he's somebody that I that I would support any day of the week. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I looked at him, and I it, I was actually shooting one of his matches that that he was the MD for, and I took I turned and I looked at him, and I said, "I want one of your holsters," and and it went from there, <laughs> right? Yeah. And your 2011 is who made your 2011? It was originally built by Doug Jones of AccuRail. And then I've had some, some tune-up jobs done by Ryan Spencer from okay. Spencer Race Gun. Um, unfortunately, Ryan is no longer in the game. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't work with guns or build guns anymore. Um, but uh, it, my, my limited 2011, I've had it since 2008. It's still kicking. Have you had to replace uh, the barrel at all yet? No, but I think that's coming down the pipe. Because yeah. uh, the last time Ryan looked at it, he's like, "Yeah, this is getting kind of worn out." And, and uh, but yeah, I think that's something that's uh, probably going to happen soon. Gotcha. Now, how many how many rounds are you on a normal year before COVID? How many rounds were you shooting downrange on a typical year? Typical year, probably four to five thousand. 
Oh, I'm surprised. That's a lot. Well, I mean, you are a very busy person, so I guess that's not a an unexcusable number, right? <laughs> yeah. It, um, practice for something, you know, I, I kind of use the Allen Iverson line of like practice. You know, mm-hmm. what are we talking? We're talking about practice. Yeah. Cause yeah, practice is something that probably happens, you know, once every two years for me. Um, usually practice, uh, I would always view practice as shooting matches. Mm-hmm. And especially if there was a major match that was coming up. I would always try to make it a point that I was going to shoot a local match the weekend prior to shooting a major. And that's what I treated practice as. Gotcha. And it's worked out for you. I mean, you're a GM, so. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff, you're, you're a GM. I mean, there's, I mean, what, what kind of drives your shooting your goals that you have now for shooting? Um, they're, they're starting to, they're starting to flip a little bit. Um, it, and a lot of it could be, you know, that this year was kind of an, it was a unsuccessful year for me. Uh, I didn't perform, you know, to my standards, to my liking and being a highly competitive person, you know, when you're not doing well, it's, you know, things become less fun. Um, you know, and there's a part of me that, that is kind of, you know, looking back in retrospect and thinking to myself, I haven't been having fun or as much fun as I used to have in the past, you know, so in, you know, with, with life and priorities and, you know, wife, family, kids, um, you know, my, my priorities are are starting to change a little bit. So I can even see the amount that I'm going to be shooting, you know, going down a little bit less. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, for, for me, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I'm very competitive, you know, so I, I want to perform up to my level and I look at myself and it's like, well, if I perform up to my level, to my standard, I should win this match. Mm-hmm. And, and if I don't win the match, you know, then I'm going home, you know, with my head down, I'm sulking, I'm mad, I'm, you know, I'm kicking, screaming, you know, and I'm, and it's like, no, this is not the way I should be doing this. And most often when I actually take that pressure off of myself and I, you know, I don't put that pressure on of like, I got to perform, I got to look the part, I got to win. If I just take the, you know, I'm here to have fun. I'm here to be around, you know, great group of people. I want to enjoy this, enjoy my time. That's usually when I actually perform better. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's, that's good. And I, if we're not having fun, what's the point of it too, right? It's like, exactly. It's like, who wants, I, I enjoy shooting, but I hate when I walk up on the grumpy person who's always angry because they're not having fun. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I'll remember not to squat with you next time or bring you more coffee. God. Some, some people aren't morning people either, but <laughs> that right. could be it too. Um, so you said you, um, your training is matches. You shoot local matches. So how many local matches do you get to shoot in a year? <laughs> If I, if I wanted to, I could shoot a local match here in the Detroit area every single Sunday from, you know, from the moment that we start shooting outdoors, you know, if, if the weather's cooperating, we get out as early as April, you know, maybe it's not until May, you know, but I could go from May, you know, April to November and shoot a match every Sunday and only have to drive an hour. It is definitely nice. It is definitely a nice thing. You only have to drive an hour, but there's a lot of clubs over there. What there's uh, DSC, you've got Livingston. That's still within an hour from uh, from you, probably. Yes. And then I don't think Brooklyn's within an hour for you. It's a little over an hour. Okay. You know, that's so not I too bad. Of, so I, I, you know, when I when I say to drive an hour, I'm also including Brooklyn along with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I mean, because it, I'd have to drive an hour and 15 minutes to reach Brooklyn. Oh, that's not but, bad at all then. Yeah. But with the, um, so like, for example, the, the schedule that we had here in the, the Detroit area this year, the first Sunday, there's a match at Brooklyn. Second Sunday is Livingston. Third is DSC. Fourth Sunday is Raccoon Hunters. And let me backtrack. The first Saturday, I could shoot at Oakland County. So mm-hmm. in a way, you know, so for the people within the Detroit area, they could shoot five local matches every month. Yep. And some people think that's crazy. I still think I like, I don't know how some of the guys do. It. I'm like, how do you still have ammo at the end of the year? I mean, right. It's like, yeah. 
I mean, I, and I'm trying to stock up for, I'm thinking about 2023 right now and 2024. I'm not even thinking, I mean, I've got ammo for this year or 2022, but I'm like, I can't burn it all in one go guys. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But so, so I typically shoot, you know, maybe one, you know, one at the most two mm -hmm. uh, local matches a month. I think that's a reasonable number. I mean, that's not too crazy. It's not like you're single and in your 20s anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah. yeah. The other thing that's uh, that's been a, a rising trend over the last, you know, five to 10 years, you know, within USPSA is that there are so many major matches on the calendar these days that you could be a person that if you had the if you had the means and the time, you could shoot a major match every weekend if oh, yeah. you wanted. It. And not as, even as soon as it starts up, you can be on the major train. Yep. Yeah. There because there, there's plenty of people that, that I've talked to that you know that I know that I shoot with that their their major match schedule consists of 15, 17 major matches over the course of the year. Can I have their pocketbook? <laughs> <laughs> exactly and it's not even the match fee it's the match fee the ammo the travel expense the food the hotel i'm like yep most people exactly. say if it's a major match it's a two grand event if they're flying yeah god i wish i had yeah. that. i wish i could drop that and go to a major event. <laughs> but yeah right yeah because what yeah because exactly like you said it's it's about that much because i've tried to i've tried to price out price out shooting nationals you know, mm -hmm. year in, year out. I've only shot nationals twice the, the, the entire time that I've been involved in the sport. Mm -hmm. And even when I try to look at it of, you know, oh, I can drive to nationals. I don't have to play, pay for a ticket. I don't have to run a car. It's still costing me a thousand dollars. That's all cheap too. too. Yeah. Yeah. Now you've been in the sport a long time. Like we were just going, I want to, um, how you you so you've been in the '90s, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yes. You've seen things then. You see things now. Do you like the direction USPSA is going, or does something need to be turned back or changed again, or what would you like the, to see? Um, I'd like to see a little bit of modification of the divisions. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's and it's only very you know it's only a very slight change you know because. Yeah, it's very easy to say that we have too many divisions, but the divisions are based off of the 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 guns and gear that we're playing with. Mm -hmm. And because of and thanks to technology, things have gotten better and things have improved and things have changed. So that you know that's and that comes with the incorporation of having carry optics, PCC, so on and so forth. And so you know, it's very easy to see, say that we have too many divisions because we have eight and mm -hmm. yes, there are, you know, and that is a lot. Um, the, the one division that I can see that I, I, I don't see the, the need for it anymore is limited time. Mm -hmm. And I say that based off of, I remember when limited 10 was first formulated within the sport as a division. And the reason why we had limited 10 it goes back to everybody competing in USPSA with a 1911-45. Mm -hmm. And at the, at the time, everybody was shooting with eight round max. And then uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name right now all of a sudden, but somebody came out with a, an 11 round single stack mag. And a lot of people started getting that. After they got that, a lot of people were having feed issues with it. And then Chip McCormick came out with a 10 round mag and the Chip McCormick 10 round mag was the most popular mag that you would see anybody with a 1911 45, especially in USPSA mm -hmm. around the early nineties is, you know, we also coined it as an arms race where that's when you started to see wide bodies come out. Mm -hmm. And cause it was para ordinance that came out with the first wide body. And I think, uh, Jerry Barnhart was the first to win nationals with a uh, para wide body that opened up the game of, okay, now everybody wants to get a wide body, but not everybody could afford it. Mm -hmm. There was getting one put together, but a lot of people are having feet issues and, you know, functionality. 
So uh, some people had the means, you know, and the money to be able to spend enough to get a wide body that worked. Once you had a wide body that worked, the way the sport was set up, the way stages were ran, you, you could not compete with a single stack compared to somebody with a wide body. Mm-hmm. There's just, there, there's just no way. So that's what created the, you know, the initial split with the divisions was you had open and you had limited. And then once everybody started using a wide body for limited, everybody shooting their 1911 was like, well, this is what I want to shoot. This is what I have. I can't afford to get everything, but I can't compete with this person or this person is beating me because I'm being, being beat by their equipment, not by the actual shooter itself. Mm-hmm. So they created a limited 10 division to support everybody that was in the sport already with their 1911s, with their 10 round ship McCormick mags. Now they had their own division that they could compete against and they didn't have to worry about competing against somebody with a wide body. Mm-hmm. And that was the way limited 10 was going until one day somebody decided, you know, oh, you know, they, they asked the question of, well, I can use my wide body and shoot limited 10 as long as I only put 10 rounds in the mag, right? And it, they're like, well, yeah, that's within the rules. And then limited 10 became a division of now everybody's shooting with their wide bodies, but they're only loading 10 rounds in their mags. And they were still able to beat people with their single stack because easier reloading, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Over the years, Limited 10 has become a slowly dying division because of so many of the other divisions that we have. Now we have a specific single stack division. So mm-hmm. everybody with, you know, so everybody who wants to shoot with their single their 1911s, they're going to compete in single stack. So there's really no longer a need for a limited 10 division unless you're within a state that has magazine restrictions. Right. But we already have a rule dictating states with magazine restrictions. Yes. Yeah. So you would say put limited 10 into single stack then? I would just say you can do without limited 10 altogether. That's kind of my, that's kind of my thought, my feeling. Okay. Fair enough. And um, I can see, you know, now with uh, the overwhelming popularity of carry optics, Mm-hmm. Pr- production is now the next uh it's it's the next division on the chopping block that's going to be a dying breed because production used to be the most popular division and mm-hmm. now it's going to be one of the least popular uh, because when you look at you know because now everybody that was shooting production they've you know gone out spent a couple hundred dollars have a dot drop down to their production gun and now they can shoot with a dot more people enjoy shooting with the dot because they can be more successful with it compared mm-hmm. to shooting iron sights. And they can now also take their magazines and they can load them up to full capacity mm-hmm. with a base pad on it. So they don't have to reload. Everybody is going to play in carry optics and no longer play in production unless they're a diehard production shooter. Mm-hmm. And there are some people who love production that much or they just yeah. don't want to spend money on a red dot, but I, I can't blame them. And right. at least for me, it seems like production has gotten away from what it was intended to be. And that came about, what, quote me wrong, if I'm wrong, early 2000s, that division yeah. came out. Yes. Right. After the Clinton, Clinton administration and all that crap. And Right. And the and from what I always heard, the basis for having production as a new division is that people were shying away from joining USPSA or shooting USPSA because they saw all of us with our custom guns and all of our custom gear. And people felt like, Oh, I got to go out and spend thousands of dollars in order just to start shooting matches. Mm -hmm. And production was a way of saying, okay, here's somebody who has, you know, they already have a carry gun or they already have you know whatever the case may be or if they want to go out and buy a new gun well they can just go into any random gun store buy a 500 dollars gun off the shelf get an uncle mike's holster a couple mag pouches and then they can take that and go and start shooting and be competitive at a uspsa match without mm-hmm. having to you know without having to spend thousands of dollars right and um 
that was the intent of production. I think the popularity and the direction that it went into within its its infancy was not something that USPSA anticipated. And you know, because they they've always maintained, here's a production gun list. If you've ever looked at the production gun list, it's like the size of the yellow pages. Oh yeah, it's long. <laughs> there, there's there's so many, and there's so many you know, rules and restrictions to say, well, is this really still a production gun? Because production division basically turned into, you know, kind of like a limited 2.0. People mm -hmm. were taking, they were still competing in the production division with a custom made gun. And they mm -hmm. were just shooting it with 10 rounds and that's it. Um, you know, so I'm not necessarily one to say that production needs to go away. Like I would say with limited 10, but I would say, you know, you know, do we want to still maintain the 10 round capacity? You know, can we just move in the direction of, you know, just load your magazines up to capacity? You know, the, the gun still has to fit in the box with the magazine in mm -hmm. whatever, whatever your mags can hold. That's what you're able to load it up to. Okay. And it's, I, it's not that I disagree with you. Here's a, I'll play the devil's advocate. At that point, would it become an arms race for production again, where it's like, I need to get like the CZP 10 F will fit in the box. It holds 19 rounds instead of a Glock 17 that only holds 17 rounds. Yeah, it would, it, it, it could, and it, it and most likely would be. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I also think that we, you know, even with the rules with where they're in place, I think we still are ending up with a bit of an arms race because of the, um, the maximum weight limit. Oh yeah. Where the boat anchor. Be, <laughs> yep, exactly. You know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, but my, my, 2011 with a stainless steel grip and a monster size magwell still you know doesn't even if that would still be legal within the weight limit mm -hmm. with a magazine it you know it's it's such a it's it's such a heavy weight that you can maintain you know within production being that heavy Right. And I enjoyed what well, was the rules before that. There was a weight, it was a lighter weight limit. It was like 40 some odd ounces or something, which yeah, I didn't think I, was unreasonable. But then there was what ounces of the gun plus two or something was at some point for production. Yeah, I can't recall um, because I never shot in production myself and I wasn't a person that would be working chrono at a major match. I never, I never took the time to, you know, always remember what the weight limit was. Mm -hmm. um 43 is a weight that stands out to me um i know 43 used to be the weight limit for single stack they just recently upped that to 45 mm -hmm. and you know and that, that leaves a little bit more flexibility you know when you're talking about having a 1911 you know steel frame gun mm -hmm. um you know but you know to have a gun you know to have something that weighs 59 ounces that is just you know like you said that's that's like holding out an iron brick Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, freaking boat anchors that you could probably hold your boat down with. To be, to yep, <laughs> that's probably literally yeah, a boat anchor. So you would say axe limited ten. Now would you add anything? Um, there's nothing that really jumps out to me to say that we would add anything, but I wouldn't be close minded to say you know no. Mm -hmm. uh, it would depend on you know the 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 intent and the direction that the sport would want to be utilizing with it. Um, I know that, you know, when PCC, you know, it's, it's something that my dad and I, you know, at live, we did this at Livingston, you mm -hmm. know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, where we would shoot the match at Livingston, take off all of our handgun gear, put the handguns away in the bag. And then we would all come out with our carbines and we would go and shoot the match again with our carbines. Mm -hmm. Just flops so and steel it, out, yeah. You know, it, it was you know it was something new, it was something different. Um, I've always had the stance that I think PCC came, I kind of came on the on the USPSA side of the the sport because at the time, three gun and you know multi gun was the fastest growing in all of shooting sports, and they wanted to try to get more of the multi gunners to cross over and mm -hmm. compete with USPSA as well. And it gave them a lot of practice where they could feel like they're still shooting with their rifle, even though it's a, it's a, it's a carbine. Mm -hmm. 
and I'd say, I mean, even before I got in the sport, it seems like since there's no three gun nation or some unifying body for three gun, it's very much a outlaw match style. No, you know what I mean? It's yeah. There's no one telling them what the rules are. They all make up their own rules. And I mean, uh, which I'm assuming is Livingston has their own home rules for their multi-gun matches. They, um, for the last number of years, they've been following uh, UML. Okay. I think UML. That that's that's the rule set that they that they abide by. Yeah, the multi, uh, the United Multi Gun League, or yeah, some whatever. I yeah, can't remember exactly every acronym in the world. <laughs> right. But yeah, so okay, and I, I I like PCC. I think some of it gets a little silly, but I mean, there's no problem. I'm, I'm, as long as everyone's having fun shooting whatever they want to bring, I mean, that's the fun. Yep. Part. Yeah, and. <clears throat> I, I remember when, when it was still a provisional division and a lot of people were griping and, you know, making, you know, oh, you know, we're going to get slowed down because we got a carbine shooter. And, you know, you heard all of the, the different semantics that people would say. And this was a particular year that, that here in Area 5, we were not going to have PCC recognized at the Area 5 map when it was here in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And they they took they ended up creating its very own PCC Area Five match, and that was held down in Sellersburg, Indiana, that mm-hmm. year. And and I went down and I worked that match, so I was down there, CRO on a stage. We were running through nothing but PCC shooters, you know, throughout the whole match, and that was the only gun that was on the range. Mm-hmm. And we had probably close to three hundred people in that match. And I got, I was able to jump in with both feet to say, yeah, you can have carbine shooters run just as fish as efficiently as, as handgun shooters, just like anywhere else. There's just, you know, there's uh, things that you can avoid, you know, that, that will definitely tie things up. But yeah, after I was, after I was at that match, I very quickly was like, yeah, I'm not going to have issues with having carbine shooters in, in my mm-hmm. squad or seeing them at a match, whatever yeah. the case may be. And I'll just say about PCC shooters, um, the fact is, like, long as they know what's up with how to debag a, a rifle and get it to the safe to the line, what they need to do, and not, they can be pretty quick because long as they know what they're doing. Yep. Yeah, it's it took quite a while because there was a lot of there was a lot of club rules that were trying to inf- and enact you know more stringent rules on on carbines and the way that they could be handled when they could be handled so on and so forth um you know because there's a lot of clubs that'll say that you know you can never have your gun go vertical and that mm-hmm. is one of the things that that's one of the you know safe directions to hold a carbine when you're at a uspsa match right and you know so probably one of the biggest the biggest tie-ups that you could have within a squad or within a match is if you have a carbine shooter or multiple carbine shooters on your squad and they wait until everybody comes off the line after resetting a stage and then they go to grab their their gun case Mm -hmm. and you know if and it took a while and i think most of the pcc shooters are are kind of aware of this and and they're always doing it now where when everybody goes down to reset and you're the on-deck shooter you're going to be walking through doing your final walkthrough of the shooting area with your carbine in hand. So mm-hmm. then when everybody comes off, you know, when everybody's done resetting the stage, they come back, the RO with the brick, you know, goes to, you know, the shooter that's in the, in the uh, starting location and they're ready to load. They're mm-hmm. ready for the make, they're, they're primed for the make ready command. And yeah. at that point, you know, they're running just the same as any, any handgun shooter. Yep. Exactly. Now, switching gears a little bit, staying on that um, mindset of uh, being an RO, how long have you uh, served as an RO slash CRO? Well, I got my first RO certification back in 95, I think, 95 or 96. And I didn't become a CRO until I started uh, started as a match director for, you know, for, for Ryan Rock. So um, it our first Ryan Rocks match was 2013 or no, 2012. Mm-hmm. No, I'm sorry. It was no 2013. So I think I got my CRO in 2014. Okay. And you've seen a lot of matches hit the ground. You've ran, you've worked a bunch of matches, I'm assuming. Um, what's yeah. the, what is, uh, 
What's the most rewarding part about being on staff, you'd think? Um, for me, seeing the match as a success. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, hearing, you know, when, when, you, when you know that it's a successful match, it's running well, um, you know, you're staying on time. Uh, when you're having squad after squad coming up to you and saying, you know, get, giving many compliments to how well, well the run, match was run, how well the stage was run. Uh, that that's what I appreciate. You know, see, you seeing the, that's my gratification is when a competitor, because when you look at it, a, a competitor that goes to a major match there, it's like satisfying the customer. Mm-hmm. And if the customer is happy with the product that they're giving you or, you know, that you're giving them, then that's what, that's what I appreciate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's honestly nice. I'll say it. It's nice to get a thank you for being there for three days on a stage in the yep. rain. <sighs> Darn you, basics. Oh. <laughs> we'll get to that hey, in you, a minute. But I mean, well, you, you had a roof. I did have a roof. I, we'll get into that one in a minute. But um, no, it's it's quite nice. And then I always thank the shooters for coming out because if they weren't there, we couldn't do it. I mean, we couldn't do like, especially for Ryan Rocks, who couldn't do it without the shooters coming. I mean, sure, you might have all the people standing on the bay waiting for p- shooters to come. But if, if no one wants to sign up and shoot the match, I mean, exactly but uh and uh, and a good reason i wanted to bring you on and so this is kind of honestly a perfect time is because registration opens up in about two weeks for your match so this will be good it'll hit the decks it'll uh, go live this will go live and we'll stir up some more hot buzz for ryan rocks 2022 but i want to talk about ryan rocks 2021 right now um that was my first major match ever and i was my and i actually worked my first major match working for you so Awesome. And it was a fun time. My squ- my my staff on that squad was awesome. Uh, everybody was awesome on the range. I So um, we had eight stages this year, if I'm correct. Yeah. Eight yes. stages plus chrono. I had never been to Livingston Gun Club either, so I'd never understood baffles. But for the listeners, will you uh, explain what how this range is really different than most? Because it's in the woods, and it's kind of funky. <laughs> um. When you're on club property, like you said, you know, you think you're in the woods. Uh, Brian Conley that, that came up from Alabama from, from Hunter's HD Gold, you know, he kept making the comment that, you know, he feels like he's walking on a nature trail. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you get to the end of the trail and, you know, hey, here's a bunch of people shooting. It's like, this is the greatest place ever. And, you know, but the, uh, it always wasn't this way, but mm-hmm. Livingston Gun Club is surrounded by re- by real estate and Very residential funny. homes. There, there's there are there, there's numerous subdivisions uh, surrounding the entire property, except for the airport. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because back in 1990, there was a period of time where the the neighbors as we as we call them they wanted to shut down and they were trying to do anything and everything that they could to try to get us shut down and their 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 try their their attempts were successful for a three-month period <laughs> and because what they were doing is they were making claims that rounds were leaving our property and landing on theirs when lo and behold they were planning that evidence there themselves because when it finally went to court, then then they had to tell the truth. Then it was, uh, yeah, I shot my barn myself, you know, or yeah, I put that bullet, you know, in my swimming pool myself. I, that did not, you know, come from, you know, I don't know, you know, I I said it happened, it came from Livingston, but I no, I put that there myself. But what did it? What occurred within that three month shutdown is that. Through the court proceedings, the only way for us to open back up again and be allowed through NRA safety standards to fire center fire rounds is we everything had to pass through a baffle system. Mm-hmm. So that that leads to us having all of our structures, you know, overhead. And the idea of the baffles are is that you you never see blue sky, you know, so it's called the blue sky effect. 
-hmm. And, you know, so the height of the baffles go in conjunction with the height of the berms and the location of where you can shoot, you know, within the, within the bays is that with where you are standing, if you were to look up and around, you should not be able to see blue sky. So that if you have any kind of negligent discharge, that's not going to impact the berm, it's going to impact the baffles and the rounds are going to disintegrate before they have a chance to leave our property. Mm -hmm. And yeah, though you have, you had eight bays for 2021. Yes. Um, you don't typically use the rifle. If I'm correct, you don't use the rifle bay unless it is Ryan rocks. If I'm correct. Yeah, there's, we, we've had a lot of issues with people not understanding how high you actually have to place your targets, uh, in order to fire a handgun because the, you know, what we call our rifle range, it's our, the longest range that we have on property. It's, it's a 100 yard bay mm -hmm. and we, and people don't take into account the elevate, you know, the, the elevation effect where, mm -hmm. you know, a, a handgun round is not going to travel on a straight line for a full hundred yards. It's going to, it's going to drop. And what we run the risk of is if people are not in it and it's primarily with, you know, members, you know, that, you know, are members of the club, but they don't place their targets up high enough. So when they're shooting a handgun, the round is going to skip off the off the the ground, mm -hmm. and it leaves the potential of it maybe hitting a rock, hitting some, you know a harder surface, skipping up, and then possibly going over the berm and leaving the property. Mm -hmm. And you know, but with us with Ryan Rocks being a major match and wanting to try to you know utilize as many of the bays as we have as possible, and because I've I've been in the sport as long as I have, and I understand the nuances of the baffles and, you know, how to arrange targets in the right way. I don't get any pushback from our executive board at Livingston you know, where basically they know, they know, they feel comfortable that I know what I'm doing exactly. and it's going to be, and it's going to be done in a way that's, you know, not going to run us into trouble. Yeah. And I want to say what the longest that the longest shot in the match this year was, was that on the hundred yard bay? Yes. Yeah. Those were the um, far ones. Yeah. It, we, we started throwing, throwing the distance out there just the, the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I'm surprised I never did it before. Um, but it was, you know, when we were trying to get the stage on the ground, uh, you know, a day, you know, two days before the match is going to begin, you know, we're, we're trying to fit everything according to the stage design on paper, you know, and when you go from a stage design on paper or on a computer program to physically building it, there's always things that have to change, you know, things don't fit, they don't look right. And we're trying to find, you know, we're trying to get all the targets out there so that we can keep the round count the same. And Bob Miller just kind of screams out, just throw them out there. <laughs> put them out there make them aim in his voice yeah throw them out I'm, there. Kind of, I'm like why did i never think of that before so we you know put them out there so yeah so for the last couple of years we've had i'd have to say you know at least a 40 yard shot mm -hmm. and i i liked that stage that was bay three that was a nice stage uh, mm -hmm. plenty of options. I would say that you, I think I even hear you say this on Brian's podcast. You love making stage designs with legitimate options. Yes. And you could see that on the ground, there was so many options. I don't think in a squad of eight to 10 people, anyone had the same plan except maybe on Bay six, because at some point you can only do that stage a certain way. Yes. But I don't want to spoil Bay 6. Besides that, it's a water hole, unfortunately. <laughs> because that was awesome. I don't know what you have planned for this year. Well, 2022. I'm already considering next year anyway. because the yeah, season's over. But yeah. if you guys are going to have to come out and shoot this match. But I, I'm kind of also forgetting why we shoot this match. I, I, I need you to share a little bit of the story of what is Ryan rocks? I guess I, I should have done that before we talked about last year's match, but no, it, okay. it kind of hits to heart when, after I hear, I heard um, the Miller's talk on Brian's show, but go ahead and uh, share with our listeners. Uh, what, why yeah. it's such a big deal. 
So, so Ryan Rocks Outdoor Adventures is a uh, it's a five hundred one c three charity that takes children with cancer and their families on outdoor trips, and it can be you know we we try to do and when I say we, um, they actually over the the years and with putting on the charity blast, they actually invited me and voted me in as a board of director. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, so I, when I say we, I also, you know, I'm, I'm part, I am part of the organization as well, but what we do is, you know, we try to do anything and everything that we can for the child. And, you know, so if they want to, you know, if we want to go, if they want to go fishing, kayaking, white, white, white water rafting, if it's something that is, you know, safe for, for the child to do, you know, horseback riding, zip lining, taking them out to Livingston with, you know, a safe full of guns and, you know, and, and a shelf full of ammo and just, you know, letting, letting them have that fun. Because it, when, when you're going through, when you're going through cancer and especially from, from a pediatric side of it, uh, w- when you're an adult going through cancer, a lot of the things that we can receive are given on an outpatient basis for, children it's not the case you know Mm -hmm. everything has to be inpatient so if you're going to go in for treatment you're going to be in the hospital anywhere from two days to a week and depending on what kind of you know the cancer type your treatment type you could be getting rounds of chemo every week it could be every two weeks it could be every three weeks you know it's it it's all a big you know what if you know depending on what you what your diagnosis is so when you are a child of any given age and you have to spend the majority of your time in a hospital, mm-hmm. it, it can, life's not fun. So Ryan rocks as an organization tries to give the kids and their, their parents and their family an escape from that being their life. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it was, it's, it's such a great thing. And, I would never, I mean, never, no one ever wants to see a child have to go through something like cancer and deal with that and the turmoil it can bring, you know, the medical bills and all of that. But it's quite nice that outdoor, Ryan Rocks Outdoor Adventures can give that escape and give them that fun outdoor, what it's nice to be a kid again kind of feel. Right. How many yeah. families have been able to go on um, retreats, I guess I'll call it. I don't know the proper word, but. Oh God. Uh, so the, the retreats, we try to do at least one retreat a year. Um, mm-hmm. and then everything COVID has just really thrown that, you know, a big monkey wrench into that. Um, but I want to say that we've taken maybe 13 families on retreats up to this point. Um, one thing that was, was such a huge blessing to Bob and Kristen was that, um, Thanks to the charity blast, mm-hmm. um, that that opened up so many doors for them to be able to take more families on retreats and, mm-hmm. and feel like they they now had a better means to to plan and and you know be able to do more than what they were they were doing prior to um, because the the Ryan Rocks charity blast is is it quickly became the single largest fundraiser for Ryan rocks, outdoor adventures. Mm-hmm. And the, and the money that we bring in from that match is, is a big source of, you know, our budget year in, year out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the amount and one, one solitary retreat that is going to be a weekend trip to Northern Michigan that for one family, you know, it's, it's going to cost, X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to say that the most success, I want, I think that the most successful charity blast that we had, the amount of money that we raised in one single year brought in enough money for us to be able to take six families on a retreat. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. And the, the whole start of everything. um, So Ryan rocks outdoor adventures is named after Bob and Kristen's son, Ryan. He was six when he was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, he passed away at the age of seven. And shortly before 
he passed away, uh, he had rainbow babies come and, you know, it rainbow, rainbow babies is, is very similar to make a wish Mm -hmm. in the sense of, you know, they, they just flooded him with anything and everything that he wanted and that he asked for. And that was something that Bob and Kristen decided they wanted to do something just like that. You know, not necessarily, you know, not wanting to step on the toes of Make-A-Wish or Rainbow Babies, you know, what, what they, they're multi-million dollar organizations that do, you know, so much more than what we could, but giving, you know, little escapes, um, you know, because there's more than just the retreats that we do. We also do uh, movie nights at the hospital for the kids. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we bring in, you know, a projector screen, play a movie, bring a popcorn cart, uh, an ice cream truck you know, things of that, you know, things of that nature. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so there's, you know, we try to give, you know, kids just a little bit of a break. And so that's where Bob and Kristen got the inspiration to start Ryan Rocks Outdoor Adventures, you know, in, you know, in Ryan's, uh, in Ryan's name. Mm -hmm. And I was introduced to Bob and Kristen because of my wife, because at the time, when Ryan was going through his chemo treatments, my wife was a pediatric resident at the same hospital. And, you know, we, so the thing that we don't, you know, you, it's one of those things that, you know, you don't, you're not supposed to say, you know, but when you are in the medical profession, Mm -hmm. we're not supposed to have our favorites, but we always have our favorites, you know, because there's always, there's always a patient that we just have a stronger connection with, you know, you really latch on to them, you, you know, you really, you know, you, you do go with a little bit of an extra step for these people, you know, because there, there's just something that, that strikes you. And when it came to Ryan, Ryan had that effect on everybody, mm-hmm. not only, not only just my wife, but all the other residents, the nurses, so just everybody absolutely loved Ryan, Bob and Kristen. Hey, dad. Hey, excuse me. Dad. Sorry. <laughs> That's my that's my youngest trying to trying to come hey, in and Dad, say hi to me. I told you. Okay. I took a picture of Dan's emoji and then I sent it to you. <laughs> okay. All right. Um so so then when my wife finally finished her residency and it's like, okay, you know, she's no longer gonna be working a hundred hours a week, maybe she's only gonna be working 70 to 80. Now maybe there's a little bit more time for me to do something. Mm -hmm. So I approached her with, you know, I wanted to have, I wanted to start putting on a major match and I wanted it to be a charity match. And, you know, because I wanted there to be a match that meant a little bit more than just another match on the calendar. You know, I wanted it, I wanted it to be something that I felt was doing more and all of the other, all of the other competitors that would come and shoot, they could actually, you know, feel, you know, the same feeling. Mm-hmm. You know, that this is more than just, hey, I'm coming to a match. They, I wanted people to feel like, you know, we're, we're doing something, you know, supportive. Absolutely. For, I, you know, and I honestly will say, I think almost everybody who comes through that match feels that they are doing a good part about that. And yes. And yeah, it's, it's nice because you draw people from all over. I mean, people from Ohio and even Kentucky, like Leif came up, I know, last year. I know he's probably come up prior years. And, Lotto, everyone from all over. I mean, Brian Conley from Alabama drove up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So when I when I told my wife that I wanted to do this, she was the one that was like, you need to do this for Ryan Rocks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then, you know, she must have told me like five or six times. And it was one of those deals that were just kind of went in one year out the other. And then one day I finally was like, who are you talking about? And mm-hmm. then she was like, do you remember this family? that I would always tell you about. And I was like, Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Well, do you think he would be open to, you know, me contacting him? And she said, you know, yes, emphatically. So I looked up Bob's number, gave him a call. He got on the phone and I introduced myself and I was like, yeah, do you know, do you remember, you know, Carla from Beaumont? And he's like, Oh yeah, of course I remember Carla. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I'm her husband. And you know, she told me to reach out to you. This is what I want to do. You know, would you be willing to sit down and discuss everything? And it just, it went from there. Mm-hmm. And what, um, one thing that I think was, you know, it was, it was a bit of a surprise for me 
Um, and it was, it was a welcome surprise. And I think it was a big surprise for, for the competitors that came, especially for the first year is that Bob, Kristen, and all of the other board of directors from Ryan rocks, they were there at the match. They were at Livingston. They were there talking to the competitors, telling them who they are, what Ryan rocks is about. And it, it really gave people that, that notion of, Yes, this really is a legit charity match. This isn't just, you know, this isn't somebody saying it's a charity and they're going to be pocketing the money. No, this is something that is going to a good cause. And if I want my money to go somewhere, I definitely want it to go here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And meeting Bob and Kristen in 2021, it was it was very nice. Bob, I mean, they're both they're the nicest people. I think you could even meet, even having to go through what they did with losing Ryan, which yes. Yeah. You know, and then, um, and then, poor, you know, poor Kristen, mm -hmm. um, because um, I want to say it's been four years now, but Bob himself was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. So not only did Kristen go through her son having cancer, now her husband had cancer. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, the, the weight that that woman has been carrying on her shoulders is unimaginable. Mm hmm. It, it is and it's luckily bob is still here and he's in remission i'm assuming yes yeah. and that's always a good thing and luckily that was for ryan rocks uh, um, charity blast that he found out that he had cancer <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was um yeah he was getting ready to go out on the range and he was applying sunscreen and as he's putting sunscreen on his neck it's just kind of like what's that? And then eventually he has Kristen take a look at it. And she's like, yeah, you got to get that looked at. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing led to another and turned out to be melanoma, which is, uh, you know, for those of you that don't know, that's a, it's an, it's a aggressive form of skin cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Luckily Bob is doing well now and uh, he's here and he's having, he's enjoying life. And I, it was nice to hear, uh, what was it? Ryan was always watching us on last year. You know, he watches every match. Yep. And he, yep. He, he let it rain on us a little bit this year, but uh, yeah, it's, he did. it's okay. Yeah, it, you know what? He, it, he'll, he'll get a pass because of all, of any Ryan Rocks event that we've ever had, whether it's the Bluegill, you know, fishing tournament to uh, retreats up north to the Charity Blast. Mm -hmm. This is the very first time that it has ever rained on a Ryan Rocks event. Yeah, he can have a pass then. <laughs> yeah. And, and it yep. only rained on Sunday. I mean, that's the, I guess, yep. only rained on Sunday. Yeah. Now, now I want to talk about 2022 a little bit. Um, it, from reading the description on practice score, we're going to have more stages? That is the plan. Okay. So they're... Um, we, I, we've been having talks and discussions of doing a little expansion at Livingston mm -hmm. where uh, we're hoping that sometime this winter, um, because we're, we're, we've had somebody look it out, give us a price quote, price quote, you know, it's, you know, we got all of our ducks in a row that we're going to get a new bay carved out. Okay. And we are, we're hoping that um, it'll be sometime soon. Um, we're, we're starting to get into winter. Um, but thankfully the, the weather's been a little bit warm enough. So <laughs> the ground hasn't frozen yet. So if, cause when the ground freezes, that makes it a little bit more, more difficult to do earth moving. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, is that yes, we'll throw in a ninth bay. Okay. And, and my, the, I've always, as much as you loved the stage on our rifle right on our rifle bay mm -hmm. that is that is like my biggest crutch when it comes to designing and building a stage for ryan rocks i hate putting stages on that bay because mm -hmm. i can never do it the way i want um, you're stuck within because, the size of the bay be, yes it's um because when you look at when you look at the bay and the way it's laid out for you know, for anybody that has never seen the bay, you don't think of it as having, you know, you can't quite think of it as having 
shooting on a side berm on the left and a side berm on the right. There is, there is a side berm on the right, but it's probably only five feet high. Mm-hmm. It and there's a road look, going through the bay. <laughs> yeah, there, there's that as well. Yeah. Um, but the the there's so much foilage on the the berms itself that it's misleading to how high the berm actually is or you know or you know how low it is because you could actually have a round go over the berm and you would be hitting the clubhouse at that point right Mm -hmm. and so it makes it very difficult to put together a a stage that will have you know the multitude of options of what i like to do um because you it 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 makes it for you start here and ev- you, you'll see a rut in the ground because everybody is starting in the same position, going here, going there, going there. It's just everybody's going to be doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so with that, with that being said, what I have in mind for that particular bay is actually putting two short stages on that bay. One will be a bit of a long range standards. And then the other is going to be um, a hoser. Okay. So what that will do is that will, you know, go, you go from shooting a hoser, you Mm -hmm. know, where you can expect, you know, a good majority of all the competitors to have a 10 plus hit factor Mm -hmm. to, all right, now we're going to go to a fixed time Virginia count stage where you're going to shoot strong hand weekend only. And, oh yeah, the, the freestyle. Yeah. Those, uh, those targets are out at 45, 50 yards. I'm game. That sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if, you know, so if everything falls into play into place, we have the, the Bay expansion that'll give us nine bays. I double up on, on Bay three. That'll actually give us a 10 stage match. That'll be exciting. And then Chrono's going to stay where it is. Yes. Yeah. Cause Chrono's yep. kind of cool. It's kind of just in the woods. <laughs> I um, mean, there's the berm, yeah. but I mean, it's, it's pretty freaking cool. Yeah. We, we used to have, um, we, we have kind of like a little, you know, what we call Chrono Bay mm-hmm. where the, you know, we, we would always implement Chrono at that station and, and Chrono would be its own separate stage by itself. And with the, you know, with the advent of having the radar chrono, uh, the radar has to, you, you have to have a longer state, a longer shot in order for the radar to work. Right. And the chrono bay that we have is just not, it's not big enough to incorporate radar. And for, you know, for me personally, I like having radar better mm-hmm. than the CED chronos. Um, I think they're more, I think they're more accurate and they're more consistent. And so with that, with, you know, the layout that we have at the, at Livingston, we put together, we have Chrono implemented along with stage eight. Mm-hmm. So Chrono is not its own separate stop. It's you shoot stage eight, you walk over Chrono and stage eight is because stage eight is a bay eight is a small enough bay that we typically only have shoots there anyhow. So mm-hmm. the the needing the entire squad for the reset is usually not necessary. No, I mean in this year stage eight. Oh, that was all that was fun. I, I mean, you had people gaming it pretty good. I mean, when I saw some of the top guys, I was like, I never thought about that, you butts. <laughs> I. I I, 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 I knew, I knew after, you know, the way I, I designed it and the way I had the stage written up, I knew how people were going to game it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well you can game it that way, but that's not the best way to shoot it. Right. The best way to shoot it is to just shoot it straight up and not, and not fall up. Yeah. Even you had, what was it? Three, three drop turners at, originally. And then we took it to two. Or was it two um, max? Or was it max traps? I had originally. It was um, trying to think. It was uh, two. It was two drop turners and two max traps. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was two and, of each. Yeah, and they they were they were sequential on each other, where uh, two would turn, 
you know, one max trap would appear, drop turner would appear, and then they would trip the next set of drop turner and max trap. Mm -hmm. As long as you nailed that reload after the steal, you could have gotten all of them. Well, at least in the current setup that was in the match, you could have gotten them all. I think anyone could have. Yeah. As long as, as, long as I, I messed up my reload, so I got four no penalty mics and a no shoot because I hit the max, the clamshell. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I flubbed my reload as well. Um, you know, but I can tell you, you know, I mean, it's, it, it didn't work out, but you know, I felt like it was going to work for, you know, for me or anybody else, because I did test it myself a couple of times, you know, while we were setting it up, you know, functionality, you know, to, you know, and see it, is this too much? And I was able to hit, you know, I did it a couple of times. I was able, as long as I hit the reload, I had enough time to get all, all eight shots in mm -hmm. before they disappeared. Well, and if I looked at the top state, like even in carry optics, um, the top guys, you had like Dave Miller and John Chin Chen shoot it where they gamed it, where they shoot at the max trap, then do the reload and then clear all the steel, then clear all the paper. Yeah. Cause they just shot at the max trap. And then you had people like, I want to say like uh, repeat Briggs and Jake Martins who just took the four, no penalty mics because they did it fast enough. Yeah. So, I mean, there was definitely multiple options on that, which is awesome. And that was a fun stage, even though, dang it, it, it I was having a great match for me <laughs> at that point. And so I was like, well, at least it's the last one. Hopefully I don't fail chrono now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah, like I said, I, I flubbed the reload. Um, one, one way that I knew, you know, people would game it is, um, you know, they, they would, they would hit their reload and then it, they, they would perform the reload and then hit the activator. Mm -hmm. And I knew they would do it. And it's like, well, you know, there's no way of stopping it. You know, I want to have, you know, I want to have something unique. I want to have something that people have not seen before. And this is the way I got to do it. People are going to game it because that's what we do in the sport. Mm -hmm. If they game it, so, so be it. Right. Well, and they will. I mean, as everyone says, gamers going to game. Yep. But, um, so Ryan Rocks, um, when is the match dates for that? It's going to be July 8th, 9th, and 10th. And we open up on the 1st. So January yep. 1st, um, it'll be, it'll probably, hopefully this year it sells out. I mean, I know last year was weird with ammunition and COVID more, more or less ammunition. I want to think than, uh, COVID related if, but I didn't see any of the people who withdrew at all. So yeah, I mean that there's there, any major match is going to have a high number of withdrawals at the last minute. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's the last two years we have definitely been hurt by COVID. Um, because we're, we're, we were not able to have our, any of our Canadians come mm -hmm. because we, we get a, we get a strong contingency from, from Canada that would come over and shoot the match. And yeah. there, that's a solid, you know, that year after year, that's a solid, you know, 30, yeah. you know, 30 people at least. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And I, and I didn't even think about that originally is that we did, there's a lot of, uh, people coming across the border right yeah so hopefully you know hopefully next year um you know because the border is open now um they can come you know j you just have to have a valid you know valid covid negative test in order mm -hmm. to come and who knows what will happen you know it's it's december now the match is going to be in july you know things could change things could stay the same right um I would hope that, you know, if, if things stay the same as the way they are now, I would hope that they would be willing to come, but you know, it, it's up to them. Yeah. You know, Cause there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of legalities and forms that have to be filled out months in advance in order to travel across the border with guns and ammunition. Oh yeah, absolutely. So you're saying everyone should sign up on January 1st. Um, it makes things easier. That's mm -hmm. for sure. Um, right. You know, but the, um, you know, th thing, th things in the Midwest, you know, that there's only been a, a handful of, you know, not even a handful, there's only been a couple of matches in the Midwest region that have been a match that was, if you didn't sign up within the first hour, you were not going to get in. Mm -hmm. um, 
that and the the most recent was Battle of the Blue, Bluegrass, which unfortunately you know uh, Kentucky is no longer having that match. Um, you know, but we are you know it did get you know somewhat replaced with what's called the mitten match. You know, mm-hmm. at Michigan as well, but. Yes, it it does make things easier, you know, when when you do sign up earlier for a match. But mat, match sign up is you know one of those things that routinely kind of you know trickles in, mm-hmm. um, you know. But I, yeah, but, mm-hmm. but definitely the more people that will, that can sign up, you know, January first, January second, it it does, uh, you know, it does make things easier on our end. Mm-hmm. You get a discount for signing up before you know, with the end of uh, January, February, March, April, end of April. Yes. So you get a nice discount. Um, I guys, I'm going to recommend you go to this match. I had a blast. You'll have a blast. Um, literally, because it's in the name. You got to have a blast. So <laughs> um, I, I definitely say go to this match. But Jeff, are there any parting words you'd like to leave with the guests? Um, just to further emphasize, you know, what you were just saying, you know, the yes, the Ryan Rocks Charity Blast is a charity match, um, but it is a legitimate level two major match. Um, even if you didn't know that it was a charity match, um, you could still come to, you know, come to Livingston, shoot this match and walk away knowing that you shot a major. It, mm-hmm. it has the look and feel and competition of being, you know, a major match on our calendar. Um, they're the highest attendance that we, we had a couple of years ago, which was pre COVID we had, 250 people in the match and you know so that's you know they're the the popularity is there and you know you can really you know test yourself and you know shoot with a lot of a lot of high-end competitors you know within within our area um and but not only that you know i i try to i try to do my best to give you stages like you don't see anywhere else um nothing that's necessarily a circus show you know, you're not going to be, you know, holding, you know, holding or throwing props or anything like that, you know, but, you know, it's, it's going to be a true, you know, shooting test. And, you know, I try to throw in optional, you know, optional plans, you know, mm-hmm. if, if you're, you know, it, my, my goal is to say, Hey, you got a, a squad of 10 people and you just saw eight different stage plans mm-hmm. you know, or more. Um, you know, it's, I try to leave you, you know, going home, having a good time. Yeah. And that, I mean, like I said, we want to have fun when we do this. So, I mean, yeah. that's, that's the part about it is like, but you'll have a fun time guys. Um, Jeff, where can they find information about Ryan rocks, um, outdoor adventures, yourself, um, Livingston, you know, where, where can they find things like that? Um, our, our website is Ryan rocks, outdoor adventures.org. Um, and if you, if you don't remember all of that, or, if, you know, it's, it's a very long tagline to type in, if you even just Google search Ryan rocks, mm-hmm. um, Ryan rocks, outdoor adventures is going to be, you know, the first hit on, on Google, um, Livingston gun club.org is, is the website for, you know, for Livingston. Um, we used to have a charity blast website, but that's kind of gone, you know, gone to the fray you know, a little bit, you know, so the majority of all of our information on the organization is going to be at Ryan Rocks Outdoor Adventures. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that that's where you can read up on, on Ryan's story, um, you know, read about Ryan, read about Bob and Kristen. There's also going to be, you know, bios of the board of directors, you know, where each of us, and it's going to, you know, give stories of, you know, things of what we do and, you know, what we provide for, for children. And as well as, you know, pictures of some of the families that we've taken on retreats. That's pretty awesome. Guys, I'm going to recommend you go check all those websites out. Um, Ryan Rocks Outdoor Adventures. Um, I think, Jeff, you're on Facebook. I mean, yes, eh, you can find probably find Jeff on Facebook. He posts probably some shooting stuff. I'm not on Facebook, so I don't know. I just hear say about it. But guys, until next time, get out and do the things. We'll catch you on the next one.